We'll get on to that after we've heard from our second uh, contributor, George Ringer, from the Copenhagen Business School, who's going to talk about the advantages to the United uh, Kingdom. And as he's setting up, I should make it clear that peer-to-peer -peer lending is not the five quid I lent Nigel Lawson the other day in the corridors of House of Lords, which he still hasn't paid me back. Okay, okay, George. Okay, um, thank, you, thank you very much. Thank you for having me here and apologies for joining in a bit late. So I um, follow up on the brilliant outline that, that you gave us and I'm uh, happy to report that I take a slightly different angle to it. <laughs> well, it may be complimentary, but um, you know, a bit of a different um, perspective and um, I um, have to clarify that I teach um, in two countries in a way. So I'm, I'm, mostly based in Copenhagen, but I also uh, teach uh, in, in Oxford, so I'm, I'm a bit of a, uh, <laughs> a European uh, animal tr tr trying to be in, in both worlds, and uh, uh, I hope I can contribute to that this debate in that way. Okay, so uh, I wanted to, to look back a little bit at the basic rationale for having a uh, capital market union or a single market or capital, whatever you call it, um, the basic economic idea is clear, and I think uh, the economic case makes sense. The idea is quite simple to strengthen the integration of uh, the still existing national capital markets that we have. Uh, but more importantly, I think against the experience of recent years and of the uh, big question mark behind banking, bank financing that we have now, uh, we want to get, get away from pure bank financing. That is particularly true for continental Europe. Uh, as, as, as we've seen in, in the presentation, uh, there is a big you know, divide on, on how firms finance themselves. And this sort of diversification idea, you know, get away from banks, get tap other ways of financing yourself is great. Uh, now, why uh, capital market? I think capital market is not an end in itself, but it's important to understand that uh, there is something uh, like the elephant in the room, right? We, not just interested in a big capital market, but we believe that capital market is good for development. Yeah, so you see, uh, this is um, yeah, uh, classic economic research showing uh, stock market capitalization uh, tends to be associated with high income countries, right? I mean, this is a, a truism, but uh, it's, it's economically uh, um, uh, proven that uh, a high capital, uh, high integration of capital markets leads to more uh, welfare in, in simple words, right? And this is what we hope to gain. So we hope to allocate all the capital there is across the EU, and most efficiently across all the countries, and then we hope to have some uh, gains overall. Now, the other big driver seems to be a comparison. If you read the green paper, it's a constant comparison to the US, right? And you, you see here the benchmark is clear. The US uh, is sort of roughly similar to GDP to the EU, but when it comes to market capitalization, uh, and the U.S. Is, is far ahead, so the, the benchmark is there, and uh, uh, the goal is uh, to you know catch up with uh, the integration, the deep integration of capital markets in the U.S. So that's the that's the economic side. But if I come back to my rationales that I started with, I think there are a number of other points that we need to add to the list. Right, uh, low interest at the moment uh, are um, a, a big problem. Uh, for uh, for some for the you know for the for the banking industry of course for the returns that we have overall so other investment alternatives need to be figured out right uh, as a simple point uh, another thing which is not so clearly mentioned in the in the green paper is also a continental European thing maybe um, to encourage maybe private pensions so most continental countries are still very much state based the pension system. But in terms, uh, in terms of low yield of capital returns, of course, strengthening the capital market will also pay pay off, in, or it's hoped to pay off in terms of um, general welfare for for um, age pensions. Now, so far, I've been you know, very much talking about continental Europe, but I was supposed to talk about the UK. So I think uh, what's in it for the UK? I think the big thing uh, that I'm uh, going to spend a lot of time on is is the politics politics around. Uh, all of this and the political signal that uh, the uh, capital markets union and the single market sends uh, to UK 
regulators and UK policy makers. Now, uh, I come back to that, but uh, first one question mark, and I think we've also already alluded to this, you could take a view and say, what's, what's the new thing about CMU, right? Because we've had it uh, for decades. Uh, the free movement of capital, which has changed article numbers a number of times, but is now article 63 to 66 in the TFEU, uh, is actually doing exactly that. It's just a different name. Uh, it's uh, ensuring a free movement of capital across the union and seeks to do exactly what I've just said. You know, abolish any national barriers, uh, uh, contribute to the efficient allocation of resources, uh, you know, uh, covering direct investments, portfolio investments, a whole lot. The downside that I think we've seen over the years is that it's sort of reactive and it's fragmented in its way because the freedom of capital is case law based. Uh, so we always need someone to take a specific case to the European Court of Justice and then fight the war over several years and then in the end of the day the result is that this one single measure from one member state might be found illegal or contradictory to the single market and needs to be abolished. But are there then consequences for the other member states to be drawn is also the other big question mark. So in many ways this case law based approach has been relatively successful but hasn't achieved the full, uh, the full benefits that we uh, expected it to do. So uh, the conclusion here is that negative integration, right? so negative integration means by way of case law, by way of free movement concept, cannot do it alone. We need to complement it with some more active, positive lawmaking like the Capital Markets Union. Nevertheless, I believe right, that Capital uh, Markets Union is, is a nice label. Right? In a way, the spirit of what you read in the Green Paper has been there uh, all along. Now, uh, the, the politics of it. Uh, three points. First point, I think the importance of the Capital Markets Union is that the EU shows a commitment to the EU 28, uh, meaning the entire EU in terms of financial or capital services. So, as we've just seen, uh, the post-crisis regulatory wave has not, not all of it, but a substantive chunk of it, in particular the banking union, all of this, has been confined to the Eurozone, plus opting in countries, uh, in the case of the FTT, a different set of countries, those who are keen to do it, right, but the, uh, the message has always been, right, only those who want to go, and uh, most importantly, the UK <coughs> was rarely on board when it was uh, deliberate, right. So, uh, there was a growing bifurcation between the core Europe, in a way, the Eurozone countries, and the rest. And I think uh, the, this new agenda is now really trying to make a point and say, no, 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 come on, we get it to a different direction now. We are still committed to get everybody on board, all 28 countries, in, including and probably most importantly, uh, including, including the UK. Second point, I think it's a renaissance of what I call market making. Uh, so if you look at the um, the history of capital markets lawmaking in Europe, and, and Neith has already described this, uh, and I sort of make a different uh, uh, separation of the different parts here, but you can you can have different views on that. The most important steps that I that I identify as sort of pre pre crisis uh, was the big boom time for capital markets law, uh, you know, financial uh, uh, law, the FSAP, the Financial Services Action Plan. Uh, you know, was the beginning of, of a decade of, of big support everywhere for more integration, more harmonization. Uh, even the UK was fought in favor of harmonization in this field. Uh, and, and, and you know, there was a big success in this field. And then, of course, it all changed from one day to the next when the crisis came out. And I think the style of lawmaking changed as well. Of course, it was much more crisis fighting. It was much more what uh, Political economists for market shaping rather than market making. Right, so uh, it, it, it included things which were not so uh, popular in, in the UK, in which you know, we saw lots of litigation trying to stop uh, unpopular things uh, that were threatening uh, the city of London. And we saw the advent of the banking union. All of this uh, was something uh, that, that showed you know, a growing tension between the UK and the Eurozone. 
And, and arguably, right, the, the new agenda now is uh, a little bit back to the market making ideal that we used to have originally. It is much more creative, it's much more talking about creating a single market again rather than fighting a crisis, right? If you, if you read it, it's not so much talk about the crisis anymore, it's more, it's more forward looking, right? It's more constructive rather than reactive to what happened. And if you think about it, you can associate with these three different steps, three different persons, right? So, uh, the first guy is Colin McCreamy, the former Irish single market commissioner, who was the sort of uh, free market guy who was very much the market maker idea. Then we had Barnier, who, who uh, happened to be in the unfortunate position of being the crisis in internal market commissioner, uh, who had to do all the unpopular things uh, on top of being a Frenchman. <laughs> uh, and then uh, uh, the new, uh, the new, as you all know, is of course Lord Hill, who um, is now, I think, playing a clever move with uh, overcoming these these disputes from the past and trying to be constructive and trying to promote a new thinking and a new way ahead uh, with this agenda. Uh, third point, uh, I think, it's also drafted in a clever way in that it sort of links to a sort of political promise overall, so it's not just a technical capital market speak or any financial jargon, but it talks a lot about welfare creation, uh, more jobs, more growth, <coughs> right, sort of things which uh, everyone can understand. And, uh, and, and of course the hope is that in the long run, a uh, deeper capital market will contribute to more growth and more jobs. Uh, but it's you know it's, it's it's clever it's clever cleverly designed and it's you know it overcomes the banker bashing uh, uh, language of the past uh, years. So it, it might you know it might prove popular in that in that context. And the other thing is that uh, there is a, a growing wariness uh, of austerity in most countries of Europe. I think uh, of, of any uh, crisis really. I mean people can't stand talking about the crisis anymore. So they want to have something new. Uh, and, and and that is exactly what this document is trying to achieve. And the fourth and the most important point, I think, uh, is uh, something, well, all of this is of importance to the UK, I think, um, but there is a specific business angle here for the City of London, of course, uh, and the single market for capital is, of course, the most, uh, most popular element of the EU for the UK because it, you know, it promises uh, to be lucrative for the financial sector. Uh, they tend to profit disproportionately actually from a big single market. If you think about it, the other member states don't have the same amount of strong financial services. What's in there for them? Well, probably something to receive the services, but the export, right, the, the financial gains are to be expected uh, here. And uh, the market making idea, you know, what, what I just described, is also something I think much more sympathetic. Uh, to the style of lawmaking that is uh, popular uh, here. Uh, final point on the list, and that's maybe a bit looking ahead, it might already be understood as some sort of ingredient to the, to the referendum debate, uh, 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 extending the hand to the UK and, you know, we can do it together, you get something out of the EU, right? You stand, you stand to accrue large benefits and, of course, having the City of London on board making them a bit more Euro-friendly is a political move which is already preparing the 2017 referendum. So it's no surprise that uh, the House of Lords EU Economic and Financial Affairs Subcommittee uh, praised the CMU as a golden opportunity for the UK, uh, but then wisely adding that it's a means to demonstrate fresh that the City of London and financial sector, which is centered here, is an asset not only to the UK, uh, but to the EU as a whole. Right? So that's the, um, the golden future. Oh, so um, in the intro time, I, I skipped that. I just wanted to add a few points of uh, critique uh, to make it not all too gloomy and golden. Uh, I think this already inspired in Lee's presentation as well. I think if you are serious about creating a capital market, Union, right, in the way of a banking union, it means really pooling resources together. It means not just creating an incremental, you know, approximation of the existing capital markets, S, uh, but it creates, it should mean a real European market and ultimately 
uh, if you're benchmarking the US, well, you need a uh, European SEC, you need a European regulator overseeing, um, overseeing uh, the European capital market. And I think that is something which is probably too hot politically and not yet on the agenda. But if you say capital markets million, I would expect that something like that, at least on the long term horizon, I think that is a serious lack of ambition. Uh, I think looking at the list of elements that are in the green paper, there is a, a strong lack of coherence. I, I do not really see the golden uh, idea here. It's a sort of a bit of everything, uh, things that are already ripe for reform. I mean, the, the prospectus directive is something, well, that's been there all the time, right? Maybe the time has come to, to, to reform it a little bit. Well, why on earth is it part of the, the capital markets union? Well, it just happened to be. You know, by timing, you happen to be right for inclusion in the big, in the big um, uh, program, anyhow. And then the conceptual approach is terribly unclear. I think there is a, a mix of almost everything they talk about. We do something bottom up, so they praise the force of the market, right? We want to remove barriers to the single market, and then the market will produce things all by itself. Some things are rather top down if you look at uh, in detail, and some, some elements are even uh, introducing the sort of 29th regime alongside the existing 28. Uh, so the methodology is, is actually very diverse. And it would have been helpful, and maybe I would um, work for an eager PhD student to think about uh, you know, what might work in which situations, so or what of these instruments that we have might be most efficiently applicable to the individual measures that uh, we see in the capital markets union. Okay, on that pessimistic note, uh, I want to turn it around a little bit um, by, um, by uh, coming to a more charitable uh, interpretation than one of my colleagues who uh, said when looking at this, this is, you know, CMU is a pretext for doing absolutely nothing. Uh, uh, some others might say, uh, and I understood even a bit like this, uh, to say, uh, at least doesn't do any great harm, right? Um, uh, my take on it would be, it's a catchy title, it has, and catchy titles, right, have their relevance, and politically speaking, as I try to say, uh, are very important and can stir a big debate and can move the debate into a new direction. Uh, but I think it's a number of initiatives which is uh, a gradual and incremental improvement of the existing <coughs> system. Uh, I'm not against it, right? I think it, you know, for what it's worth, it, it has its merits. Uh, and politically speaking, I think it's the most important side of, of, the, of the capital of things. But it's certainly not uh, giving us a full uh, union uh, over the next years. Thanks very much. Thanks very much. George was kind enough to quote from our a report on capital markets union, and I have to say the uh, the attempt that we had to make sure that it was understood that the City of London is an EU resource. Of course, it's a global centre, but we should promote it as the European Union's uh, major financial centre. We didn't always get that feeling when we were taking evidence from the City of London that they were keen to do so. Uh, thanks to George and to Neve. Neve's particular point about whether we should talk about a single market in capital or the catchier title that George has alluded to. Would you please, could I see a flurry of hands of those who would like to contribute either just a comment or indeed a question. We have about 10-15 minutes left to in this session. If you'd be kind enough to say who you are, where you come from, in the good old silver black tradition, then, then I'd be most grateful for you, sir. Thanks. Uh, Suresh Rasenga from Treasury Legal Advisors. I, mean, I agree with what you say, that I mean, a large part of this is political posture, sending a signal about the uh, 28 rather than focus on the Euros. But I find that quite difficult to reconcile with the statement in the five presidents that as part of EMU, you have a capital markets union supervisor. Now, that may or may not have merit in the context of capital markets union in its own, but it seems to have undone, uh, potentially undone, a lot of the goodwill about trying to keep it to a part. Let's take a few comments. <coughs> One of your back there, please. And then with George, you, you come back to that. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, sure. From, from uh, just a question. 
very quick uh, on this presentation. You know, I agree with you, you know, it's, you know, there's a good draft for us to be skeptical, but, but would you go as far as rejecting the whole idea of a capital market here? And on Gerald's presentation, um, I, I was actually quite surprised that the UK was so much in favour of the project because I wouldn't have expected them. Uh, mainly because you know these are ideas, and ideas are open to change. And I think there is one part which is probably missing in the story and this equation between the UK being in, in, in favour of the capital markets union, which is the fact that they have uh, Commissioner Hill uh, at the European Commission, and I think that would probably make a difference for that. Well, it was the cleverest, smartest move <laughs> going that Juncker made, which was to give a surprise, surprise, the financial job to uh, a Brit. But, Gail, there are two points there. Would you like to take those then? Yeah, sure. And maybe you could uh, respond to, to our colleagues well. Okay. Should, should I start? Yeah, yeah please. Um, okay, so on the five president's report, um, yeah, I mean, if they, you know, if they ultimately develop this to a true, a true, a genuine capital market, genuine securities market, Great. I, I, I did not discuss the Five Presidents report because I think it's a little bit political day daydreaming. And it, it also has its political mission, I think, to distract us for a moment from Greece and to, uh, to, 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 to symbolize a little bit that Europe is alive and has its own vision. So I, I think it's a vision, right? It would be great, but I'm really focusing on what is on the table now. I mean, the Green Paper is really concrete and they're going to do it. And I'm you know, all, I've, all I've been asking is, you know, what, what does this contribute to the, to the current debate, to the current instruments that we already have? And on, on, on Pierre's point, yes, I absolutely agree that uh, I, I deliberately left out the uh, uh, remark concerning the nationality of the current commissioner, but it, it certainly helps. I agree, although, um, yeah. Uh, Go on, you say it, say it. <laughs> what, what you think? <laughs> no, I mean, you, you could take a different view and say, uh, because he's British, he um, needs to be super keen that he does not favour the city of London over other financial centres in Europe. So that might also be a, a sort of European angle on looking at it. He might, you know, he might not be overly pro-British in that sense. He might Indeed. be allowed to. Lee, would you like to take your... Yeah, Chris, so a colleague from the Treasury. Um, yeah, I mean, the, uh, this, is, this one worries me with the Capital Markets Union label because you get the spill over, spill over very quickly into banking union. And banking union is, above all, an executive operational institutional structure. The single rule book is, is, is dealing with the single market. So, you know, the things I was pointing out, for, for a union to work, you need resolution. We are 50 years away from resolution in security markets. Um, we still have big political issues about ESMA. ESMA is only a network, and yet there are serious difficulties about what I can account in the securities market. So I think you know, there's a real kind of spillover kind of thing I worry about there. Um, and Pierre, yes, I guess I'm being filmed, so why not go for it? I would reject it, and I'll give you a couple of reasons why. Okay, so we've had um, seven or eight years of intense regulatory reform. What do we need to do? We need to fix the definition of bank capital. Now, I mean, I'll probably get my numbers wrong. I could be out by a magnitude, and my Treasury colleague will probably correct me on this, but I think because of variations in how capital is assessed across the ECB's asset quality review, I think the divergence was, was it 100 billion? It was massive. There was huge balance sheet differences because of this. Now, you know, we've got to fix that. We have to fix things like there are different definitions of derivatives across the major measures. That has to be fixed. IFRS 9. Is that going to work correctly? It's not even agreed at the EU yet. Banks are already planning for life rest now. It's not adopted. Um, resolution, the big, big question. You know, how is this going to bed in? So I would reject it insofar as it has this distraction danger, where I think there's an awful lot to do over the next few years. I utterly endorse what Georg is saying. Yes, of course we need deeper capital markets, but I would rather have this developing incrementally. And like, for example, just really quick footnote, the market does what the market does best. It responds to conditions and it tends to do it efficiently. For example, funds are increasingly doing loan origination. That is a business response to a contraction in funding by the banks. So, okay, it may be slower, it may be less glamorous, it may not happen as fast as we'd like, but you, you do get the market responding. And, and so, yes, if I'm going to make a big statement, I, I, I think I would reject it. A colleague here, and please show me a colleague here, and then you, sir, and then one at the back. Right, I'm Jonathan Buster. At the moment, I'm a senior lawyer at, at the European Securities and uh, 
Market's Authority, and I mentioned there on the secondment of the Financial Conduct Authority in London. Um, can I make a comment and perhaps uh, end it with a question? Um, I think Neve um, was uh, uh, focusing on the fact that this needed um, a Europe wide movement and couldn't be done by the member states alone. Uh, Georg went on to uh, say that um, uh, one single market, perhaps ideally, should have an SEC like uh, single regulator. Um, I guess my question is this this might perhaps lead to more. Um, uh, direct regulation um, being directed at ESMA or um, uh, some similar body, but structurally, how easy is it to have a single European regulator against the background of the Moroni case, even following short selling, because you have a whole delegation problem here. Welcome any comments from the panel. I thought the Moroni case was actually queried, but could you hold that one there? <laughs> so I've got a colleague there and one at the back, please. Yeah, you, sir. Yeah. I'm Wayne Jacoby from Brigham Young University, and my question to institutions, and you were racing very fast at that time, but uh, the, the question is to elaborate just a little bit on these national differences. Are, do you have kind of a test in your mind that helps you decide where a particular instrument that a nation might use is, 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 is a legitimate difference uh, versus an, er an area where it seems uh, much more compelling that a harmonious regulation is really necessary to make the, the single market work. Fine, and you, sir, at the back, you were indicating, were you? No, you weren't, all right. So, Dean, uh, there are a couple that were directed at you, and Gail, perhaps you, you'd follow up. Yeah, absolutely. It's impossible. You, you can't, there's no way you can do this on a um, So how would we do it? What the mood music one hears is of the expedited treaty reform, where we would avoid the referenda. So if there was appetite, that is the only way I can see it. Like Moroni, we're, we're pushing at that boundary of Moroni so hard. That, you know, so I completely agree. Um, on the differences of caption and so on, <clears throat> my colleague from Brigham, um, I suppose the two points I was really making here. One is, it sort of goes to the feasibility of this. So when we have these different varieties of capitalism, and really all I mean by that is the deep institutional structures in the member states. So for example, if we look at Germany and we have this traditionally deep reliance on bank funding, um, very close sort of stakeholder relationships with employees, with suppliers, with producers, the whole system is sort of geared to bank funding in a way that other systems aren't. Um, Italian households will quite willingly lend their household cash into the bond markets in a way that UK investors won't. So uh, what I would worry is, given that all that sort of entrenched difference has to be got at, and that's almost impossible to do through law, my concern is, in an attempt to do that, we start tinkering with things that are actually working pretty well. But then to go to your other point about where do we allow difference where one might naturally think harmonization makes sense. But one area that immediately comes to mind, and the council I think has just agreed on this against all odds, um, is bank structural reform. Um, so I think there is a very strong case for allowing member states to have their particular approaches to where they put ring fences, how they organize groups, securities, banks intermingling together. The continental model, as Georg has, has, has discussed, is very, very different some other institutional structures. And I think, think that the compromise that the council has come up with is, is going to allow a degree of divergence. So for example, we will not have the, um, the Dodd-Frank approach, where you have a clean approach to the structural reinvents. And I think that's exactly the kind of difference that we need to live with. But the difference we can't live with, really quickly, is the financial transaction tax. This is incredibly problematic. I think you're doing that deliberately to provoke me. Yeah. Uh, but before I come to Gail, is there one last question that uh, for our two panelists? If not, Gail, would you like to? Uh, I would. I would. Thank you. Uh, I just wanted to respond to Neve's last point uh, and what, what you said. The uh, variety of capitalism is an interesting concept, and it's true that the capital market are still very different. So you might want to ask the question: Do we need to? Or does it make sense to harmonise in the first place? Right? If, the EU system are still the, the market realities are still so different. And indeed, if your argument is that uh, great, we have a structural reform directive coming up or regulation directive uh, coming up now, but the great thing about it is that it allows a lot of flexibility. Then we might ask ourselves, right, what, why do we harmonise in the first place? 
My personal take on it is the EU is best at doing the sort of cross-border elements or the, uh, the market making that I described. So for example, technical way of accessing other capital markets, you know, dealing with cross-border movements in shares or allowing shareholders to vote, allowing shareholders to access prospectuses, I mean, all those things, You're talking about language issues in, in Europe. So these, these cross-border movements are what Europe is best at, and that is probably what they should, um, what they should start with. Uh, one, one, one final comment on the Maroni question. Uh, I, I completely share your, your both views, um, although after short selling, it's become probably a bit easier. The only, the only real possibility that would exist would be you know, to entrust the Commission with uh, doing this. Uh, and if you can't delegate it right, to new European bodies, right, let the Commission do it. And if you look at all the banking union, uh, the SRB, and you know, all the all the institutions, they basically are de facto independent bodies, but they have to be endorsed by well, the Commission then, uh, or ESMA, uh, right? And most, most of this, what it does, uh, the Commission then has the last word. Why don't we just uh, make a new department at the European Commission that you know, supervises the market, uh, has broad executive powers? I, I just uh, to make a provocative uh, <laughs> claim. Yes, yes, well. Can I make a one sentence provocative, Please, provocative yeah. reply as well? Of yeah. course, I suppose the way to do it is to change the treaties. Yeah. Well, okay. I think changing the treaties is a point that I've come in on, which is of some sensitivity at the moment. But colleagues, on you, your behalf, please, would we thank Gail Gandhi for starting off the morning and the conference in such a vigorous and animated way. Many thanks indeed. For this part of the something like that, at least on the long-term horizon. I think that is a serious lack of ambition. Uh, I think, looking at the list of elements that are in the green paper, there is a, a strong lack of coherence. I, I do not really see the golden uh, idea here. It's a sort of a bit of everything. Uh, things that are already ripe for reform. I mean, the, the prospectus directive is something, well, that's been there all the time, right? Maybe the time has come to, to reform it a little bit. Well, why on earth is it part of the, of the capital markets game? Well, it just happened to be, you know, by timing, it happened to be right for inclusion in the, in the big um, uh, program anyhow. And then the conceptual approach is terribly unclear. I think there is a, a mix of almost everything. They talk about, we do something bottom-up, so they praise the force of the market, right? We want to remove barriers to the single market, and then the market will produce things all by itself. Some things are rather top down if you look at uh, and detail. And some, some elements are even uh, introducing a sort of 29th regime alongside the existing 28. Uh, so sort of the methodology is actually very diverse. And it would have been helpful, and maybe I was um, work for an EGF PhD student to think about uh, you know, what might work in which situations or what of these instruments that we have might be most efficiently applicable to the individual measures that uh, we see in the capital markets here. Okay, on that pessimistic note, uh, I want to turn it around a little bit um, by, um, by uh, coming to a more charitable uh, interpretation than one of my colleagues who uh, said when looking at this, this is, you know, CMU is a pretext for doing absolutely nothing. Uh, uh, some others might say, uh, and I understood even a bit like this, uh, to say, uh, it at least doesn't do any great harm, right? Um, uh, my take on it would be, it's a catchy title, it has, and catchy titles right, have their relevance, and politically speaking, as I try to say, uh, are very important and can stir a big debate and can move the debate into a new direction. Uh, but I think it's a number of initiatives which is uh, a gradual and incremental improvement of the existing <coughs> system. Uh, I'm not against it, right? I think it, you know, for what it's worth, it, it has its merits. Uh, and politically speaking, I think it's the most important side of, of, the, of the capital of things. But it's certainly not uh, giving us a full uh, union uh, over the next years. Thanks very much. Thanks very much. George was kind enough to quote from our 
the report on capital markets union, I have to say the, uh, the attempt that we had to make sure that it was understood that the City of London is an EU resource. Of course it's a global centre, but we should promote it as the European Union's uh, major financial centre. We didn't always get that feeling when we were taking evidence from the City of London that they were keen to do so. Uh, thanks to George and to Neve. Neve's particular point about whether we should talk about a single market in capital or the catchier title that George has alluded to. Would you please, could I see a flurry of hands of those who would like to contribute either just a comment or indeed a question? We have about 10-15 uh, minutes left to in this session. If you'd be kind enough to say who you are, where you come from, in the good old Silla Black tradition, then, then I'd be most grateful you, sir. Thanks. Uh, Suresh Wurst, from Treasury Legal Advisors. I agree with what you say that I think a large part of this is political posturing, sending a signal about the uh, 28 rather than focus on the Euros. But I find that quite difficult to reconcile with the statement in the five presidents' reports that as part of EMU, you have a capital markets union supervisor. Now, that may or may not have merit in the context of capital markets union and so on, but it seems to have undone, uh, potentially undone, a lot of the goodwill about trying to keep it to a part. Let's take a few comments. One at the back there, please. And then with George, you, you come back to that. Mm -hmm. oh, yep. Uh, yeah, sure. From, from London, uh, just a question, very quick. Uh, on this presentation, you know, I agree with you, you know, it's, you know, there's a good draft, but who wants to be skeptical about it? But would you go as far as rejecting the whole idea of a capital market season? And on Gelb's presentation, um, I was actually quite surprised that the UK was so much in favour of the project because I wouldn't have expected that. Uh, mainly because you know these are ideas and ideas are open to change. And I think there's one part which is probably missing in the story and this equation between the UK being in, in, in favour of the capital markets union, which is the fact that they have uh, Commissioner Hill uh, at the European Commission. And I think that would probably make a difference for that. Well, it was the cleverest, smartest group <laughs> going that Juncker made, which was to give the surprise, surprise, the financial job to uh, a Brit. But, Gail, there are two points there. Would you like to take those then? Yeah, sure. And maybe you could uh, respond to, to our colleagues as well. Okay. Should, should I start? Yeah, yeah please. Um, okay, so on the High President's report, um, yeah, I mean, if they, you know, if they ultimately develop this to a true true, a genuine capital market, a genuine securities market, great. I, I, I did not discuss the Five Presidents report because I think it's a little bit political day daydreaming. And it, it also has its political mission, I think, to distract us for a moment from Greece and to, uh, to, 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 to symbolize a little bit that Europe is alive and has its own vision. So I, I think it's a vision, right? It would be great, but I'm really focusing on what is on the table now. I mean, the green paper is really, Concrete, and they're going to do it. And I'm, you know, all I've all I've been asking is, you know, what what does this contribute to the to the current debate, to the current instruments that we already have? And on on, on Pierre's point, yes, I absolutely agree. That it's, uh, I, I deliberately left out the uh, uh, remark concerning the nationality of the current commissioner, but it it certainly helps. I agree, although, um, yeah. Uh, you know, say you know, it, say it. <laughs> what do you think? <laughs> no, I mean, you, you could take a different view and say, uh, because he's British, he um, needs to be super keen that he does not favour the city of London over other financial centres in Europe. So that might also be a sort of European angle on looking at it. He might, you know, he might not be overly pro British in that sense. He might Maybe. be allowed to. Lee, would you like to take your... Yeah, Chris, so a colleague from the Treasury. Um, yeah, I mean, the, uh, this, is, this one worries me with the Capital Markets Union label because you get the spill over, spill over very quickly into Banking Union. And Banking Union is, above all, an executive operational institutional structure. The single rule book is, is, is dealing with the single market. So, you know, the things I was pointing out, for, for a union to work, you need resolution. We are 50 years away from resolution in the securities markets. 
Um, we still have big political issues about ESMA. ESMA is only a network, and yet there are serious difficulties about what I can account in the securities market. So I think you know, there's a real kind of spillover kind of thing I worry about there. Um, and Pierre, yes, I guess I'm being filmed, so why not go for it? I would reject it, and I'll give you a couple of reasons why. Okay, so we've had um, seven or eight years of intense regulatory reform. What do we need to do? We need to fix the definition of bank capital. Now, I mean, I'll probably get my numbers wrong. I could be out by a magnitude, and my treasury colleague will probably correct me on this, but I think because of variations in how capital is assessed across the ECB's asset quality review, I think the divergence was, was it 100 billion? It was massive. There was huge balance sheet differences because of this. Now, you know, we've got to fix that. We have to fix things like there are different definitions of derivatives across the major measures. That has to be fixed. IFRS 9. Is that going to work correctly? It's not even agreed at the EU yet. Banks are already planning for life rest now. It's not adopted. Um, resolution, the big, big question. You know, how is this going to get in? So I would reject it insofar as it has this distraction danger, where I think there's an awful lot to do over the next few years. I utterly endorse what Georg is saying. Yes, of course we need deeper capital markets, but I would rather have this developing incrementally. And like, for example, just really quick footnote, the market does what the market does best, it responds to conditions and it tends to do it efficiently. For example, funds are increasingly doing loan origination. That is a business response to a contraction in funding by the banks. So, okay, maybe slower, maybe less glamorous, it may not happen as fast as we'd like, but you, you do get the market responding. And, and so, yes, if I'm going to make a big statement, I, I, I think I would reject it. A colleague here, and please show me a colleague here, and then the user, and then we'll follow the back. Right, I'm Jonathan Buster. At the moment, I'm a senior lawyer at ESMA, the European Securities and uh, Markets Authority. I'm actually there on secondment for the Financial Conduct Authority in London. Um, can I make a comment and perhaps uh, end it with a question? Um, I think Neve um, was uh, focusing on the fact that this needed um, a Europe wide movement and couldn't be done by the member states alone. Uh, Georg went on to uh, say that um, uh, one single market perhaps ideally should have an SEC-like uh, single regulator. Um, I guess my question is this, this might perhaps lead to more um, uh, direct regulation uh, being directed at ESMA or um, uh, some similar body, but structurally how easy is it to have a single European regulator against the background of the Moroni case, even following short selling? Because you have a whole delegation problem here. Welcome any comments from that. I thought the Moroni case was actually queried, but could you hold that one there? So I've got a colleague there and one at the back, please. Yeah, you, sir. Yeah, I'm Wayne Jacoby from Brigham Young University, and my question to institutions and you were racing very fast at that time, but uh, the, the question is to elaborate just a little bit on these national differences. Are, do you have kind of a test in your mind that helps you decide where a particular instrument that a nation might use is, 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 is a legitimate difference uh, versus an, er, uh, an area where it seems uh, much more compelling that a harmonious regulation is really necessary to make the, the single market work? Fine, and you, sir, at the back, you were indicating, were you? No, you weren't, all right. So, uh, Neve, there are a couple that were directed to you, and Gail, perhaps you, you'd follow up. Really quick, so, Jonathan, yeah, absolutely, it's impossible. You, you can't, there's no way you can do this on your own. Um, so, how would we do it? What, what the mood music one hears is of the expedited treaty reform, where we would avoid the referenda. So if there was appetite, that is the only way I can see it. But Moroni, we're, we're, we're pushing at the boundaries of Moroni so hard. That, you know, so I completely agree. Um, on the differences of caption and so on, <clears throat> my colleague from, from Brigham, um, I suppose the two points I was really making here. One is, it sort of goes to the feasibility of this. So. When we have these different varieties of capitalism, and really all I mean by that is the deep institutional structures in the member states. So, for example, if we look at Germany and we have this traditionally deep reliance on bank funding, um, very close sort of stakeholder relationships with employees, with suppliers, with producers, the whole system is sort of geared to bank funding in a way that other systems aren't. Um, Italian households will quite willingly lend their household cash into the bond markets in a way that UK investors won't. So, uh, what I would worry is given that all that sort of entrenched difference has to be got at, 
and that's almost impossible to do through law. My concern is, in an attempt to do that, we start tinkering with things that are actually working pretty well. But let's go to your other point about where do we allow difference, uh, where one might naturally think harmonisation makes sense. Well, one area that immediately comes to mind, and the council I think has just agreed on this against all odds, um, is bank structural reform. Um, so I think there is a very strong case for allowing member states to have their particular approaches to where they put ring fences, how they organize groups, securities, banks intermingling together. The continental model, as Georg has, has, has discussed, is very, very different to some other institutional structures. And I think, think that the compromise that the Council has come up with is, is going to allow a degree of divergence. So for example, we will not have the, um, the Dodd Frank approach, where you have a clean approach to the structural reinvents. And I think that's exactly the kind of difference that we need to live with. But the difference we can't live with, really quickly, is the financial transaction tax. This is incredibly problematic. I think you're doing that deliberately to provoke me. Yeah. Uh, but before I come to Gail, is there one last question that, uh, for our two panellists? If not, Gail, would you like to? Uh, I, would, I would, thank you. Uh, I just wanted to respond to Neve's last point. Uh, and what, what you said, the uh, variety of capitalism is an interesting concept. And it's true that the capital market are still very different. So you might want to ask the question, do we need to, or does it make sense to harmonize in the first place, right? If, if the new system are still, the, the market realities are still so different. And indeed, if your argument is that, uh, Great, we have a uh, structural reform directive, coming up, or regulation directive, uh, coming up now, but the great thing about it is that it allows a lot of flexibility, then we might not ask ourselves, right, what, why do we harmonize it in the first place? My personal take on it is the EU is best at doing the sort of cross-border elements of the, uh, the market making that I described. So for example, technical way of Accessing other capital markets, you know, dealing with cross border movements in shares or allowing shareholders to vote, allowing shareholders to access prospectuses, I mean, all those things. You're talking about language issues in, in Europe. So, these, these cross border movements are what Europe is best at, and that is probably what they should, um, what they should start with. Uh, one, one, one final comment on the Moroni question. Uh, I, I completely share your. You have both views, um, although after short selling, it's become probably a bit easier. The only, the only real possibility that would exist would be you know, to entrust the Commission with uh, doing things. Uh, and if you can't delegate it right, to new European bodies, right, let the Commission do it. And if you look at all the banking union, uh, the SRB, and you know, all, the, all the institutions, they basically are de facto independent bodies, but they have to be endorsed by well, the Commission then. Uh, or ESMA, uh, right? And most, most of this, what it does, uh, the Commission then has last word. Why don't we just uh, make a new department at the European Commission that you know, supervises the market, uh, has broad executive powers? I, I mean, just uh, to make a provocative uh, <laughs> claim. Yes, yes, well. Can I make a one sentence provocative? Please do. Uh, provocative reply is what, of yeah. course, I suppose the way to do it is to change the treaties. Yeah. Well, okay. I think changing the treaties is a point that I come in on, which is of some sensitivity at the moment. But colleagues, on you, your behalf, please, when we thank Georg and me for starting off the morning and the conference in such a vigorous and animated way. Many thanks indeed.